Thank you, Mr. John. Mr. K. Srinivasan is the Managing Director of Carborandum Universal Limited, QME as it is popularly known, a 2004 co company, 2400 crore company with 28 manufacturing sites in seven countries. Since taking over as a Managing Director in 2005, Mr. Srinivasan has grown QME from a leading abrasive, Indian abrasive company to a global player with major operations in Russia, China, South Africa, Australia and Thailand. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Srinivasan as I now invite him to present the keynote address. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Um, Mr. C.K. Ranganathan, Mr. Ram Kumar, Group Captain, and of course, John. It's a great pleasure to be on a panel with such eminent speakers. Uh, I have been invited here to share my experience of being a part of the Murugappa Group. So let me start by bringing greetings from the Murugappa group and our chairman, Mr. M.M. Murugappa. The Murugappa group, as some of you may know, was the first Asian business that was awarded the IMD Lawson Award for Outstanding Family Managed Business in 2001. So when I speak about my experiences about, so when I speak about my experience about working in a family business, I expect that in sharing this, there is some learning for some of those people who are still running family businesses. Family businesses, like all of them mentioned, has been there for many, many years. Uh, most economic activity in developing countries starts largely through family organizations and eventually blossoms into larger corporates. As the countries develop, they have less of family businesses as the corporates become much larger. So if you look at it, Developing world has something like about 60 to 85 percent of all its businesses as family businesses. But in America, it would probably be nearer to about 30 percent. But there are always exceptions. Walmart, one of the largest um, retailer, is still a family business. So there is no uh, specific rule that as you become bigger, you will not be a family business. So that's the first caveat I take before I start. Family businesses largely have to grapple with the five C's. They first need capital, then they need to have control. They have to have a career for all its constituents, the members of the family. They have to learn to manage conflict. And of course, they have to create a culture which will hold them all together. So these are the traditional five C's of a family business. And I'm going to share the Murugappa story and to see how these five C's played out in, in its last hundred odd years. In addition to the traditional 5C, I would add one extra C for developing countries, and that's contacts. You need to have a network, and this helps you, particularly in the early days of building a company. So let's go back to the Murugappa story. More than 100 years back, in the plantations of Burma, the laborers needed to have funds provided to them, so they needed some kind of an indigenous banking. And to provide this indigenous banking, the Chetiyas of South of Karaikudi area went there to provide them money. They didn't have capital, so they actually borrowed the money from the Lalas and Sates of Bombay. And they lent this money to the laborers in the plantation. So they actually were playing an arbitrage game. They were borrowing and they were lending, and they were making money in between. The reason why the investors handed out the money to them was they were trustworthy. The reason why the borrowers could borrow from them was, again, they were trustworthy, industrious, hardworking. They were not charging them usurious rates. They were charging them fair rates. They were a family. They would help them during times of distress. And they grew the business this way. And eventually, they built up the first C, capital. And the first C of capital was built basically by being industrious, trustworthy, hardworking, and being a part of the culture in which they worked. They could speak Burmese, they could speak Tamil, they learned all the languages, they spoke, uh, they spoke English fluently, much better than me probably. And this helped them to network and connect up with the Britishers of those days there. And this helped them in good stead when they had to come back after the the communist revolution in Burma made it impossible for people to stay and work there. They lost most of their assets there. And when they came back to India, 
this network, or the sixth C as they talk of, Connect, allowed them to set up manufacturing in India. The first thing they set up was to try and make steel cupboards and steel furniture at a place about 15 kilometers from here, at Thiruvathur. They had set up this plant, they had got themselves a shed, and this was really early days just before the war. It was very difficult to get anything done in India. They brought an old rice barn shed from Burma, set it up, and started making steel cupboards and furniture in the brand name of Ajax. And to finish it, they needed what is called as a sandpaper, something which you need to rub before you paint. And this was not available because war was practically breaking out in Europe, and this was all going into war supplies. They managed to locate an old maker, again using the sixth C of contact, in Midwest of Canada. A maker is where you make those sheets. It's like what you run your clock through. And they had it boxed, shipped out by steamers, and the technicians were supposed to come here to commission it. The steamer landed, the containers landed, and the technicians didn't. So the next two years, they battled around trying to make it work and tried to produce paper-coated abrasives, which is used for sanding. And in the process, they learned to make coated abrasives. And what was Ajax steel cupboard and furniture ended up as Ajax abrasives, which is the precursor to carbonum universal as we see today. So this helped them to get into business. And they started using the capital and the contact to build up a small business. They lost part of the capital when they came to India but the contacts helped them to revive and set up business. Early days, all the members of the family had to work together to put this thing together. So what happened, what started earlier as a first generation of entrepreneurs moved to the next generation as inheritors. Now, this is the inheritor. They had already set up the abrasive business, and this had to be built and grown. We had independence coming, and we had other opportunities. They used their contacts, and they started tying up with various British companies, with uh, the Birmingham Steel Company, which is the BSA. Um, they built up various businesses in India. And with this, they created a career for the next generation of people. So that's his third C. You create capital, then you build a career for the next generation of people who are really the inheritors. The inheritors were as industrious as the entrepreneurs. They built the business, they worked diligently, they stayed together, and they ensured that business progressed. But as business progressed, it became more complex, it became more difficult to run. So that is where you need to understand the third C of control. They needed to have control over their businesses. They had started most of their businesses in partnerships because that was the need of the day. So you have Tube Investments with uh, TI of UK. They had the uh, Birmingham Small Arms for BSA bicycles, etc. They had Carborundum, which is a tripartite joint venture with Carborundum, Niagara Falls, Universal Grinding Wheel Company, Staffordshire, as well as the Murugappas. Incidentally, they were not known as Murugapas in those days. Each of them called different names. They called them the TI group. They called them different names at that time. And they used the transition to actually get control. They had built a business, and they gradually bought in into their collaborators. And as the collaborators exited, they brought in, they bought their shares and established control. They had in most of the businesses by this time between 40 to 50 percent of their shares. Control not only in terms of share ownership, but also in terms of the way they manage their businesses. So that was the third C, as I would say. The fourth C is most important. Businesses, family businesses don't last more than three generations, not even 3% last. The reason is the fourth C, which is conflict. If you don't have in place strong conflict resolution systems, you don't have in place effective conflict management. You don't have structures which will prevent major conflict breaking out. Conflicts are inherent in family business, and that's the first reason why not even 3% of the businesses last for more than three generations. So they had the strong conflict revolution processes in place, and what did they do for this? They first had two levels of management, and I think Ram Kumar did mention about it. They had what is called as the family management council, which really managed the family. 
In the early days, the first generation when they came here, they could study in PSI school. Some of them couldn't study, but they then didn't do, they did go abroad and do some ma management programs. But in the next generation, they set up strong criteria. They said each youngster must go abroad and study at least for two years. Must work in outside companies at least for two years, not in the group. Must come and do apprenticeship under a business which is not where his father is working. And he would work with one of, and he would be mentored by one of the uncles. So there were strong rules put in place. There were rules that even if a family member of a particular generation get the same salary, he would not have a car better than his boss. If the family could afford, and he could afford to buy himself a good car, but if he's, let's say, going to work under me, and if I'm entitled to use a particular car, he must not and cannot have a car better than mine. So there were strong rules and regulations. He must be seen as a part of the organization structure. And so these all ensured that conflicts were managed well in time. The family council meets once a month, and the family council has all the family members as members, and that's male family members. That's another thing probably that will change over a period of time. And the, I'm sorry, that's what it is. <laughs> I see a lot of ladies shaking their, hand, their heads. Okay. So but that's where it is, and I'll come and see how they manage that part of it as well. So the family members would all meet in this council, and the leader of, and the council would deliberate on the various issues. And the Kata, who is the senior most male family member, would take the final decision. And his word is final. Irrespective of what it is, that's final. And when he says that's it, and that's it. So it ends there. The business, like Ram mentioned, was separated from management. The management was run by professionals. A professional can also be a family member if he had come through the business. He would also not be, let's say, um, barred from running businesses if he has come through the business. And they would run the business as professionally as any other, anybody else. So ownership and management was fairly diverse. So they were diverse from each other. So we call ourselves a family-promoted, family-guided, professionally-managed company. So conflict was largely avoided by this, and conflicts were quickly resolved. Many of the family members, if they do not make the cut and do not have the interest to be in the family business, they would still get the same compensation as through the family office as what a, a cousin of his or a par person in the same bracket would get, but he need not be working in the business. So it was not mandatory that every family member must be in the business. Now coming to the ladies of the family. So what they normally did is the ladies of the family were in charge of looking at all the CSR activities. The family as early as 1922 had started some level of formal CSR activity and this was formalized by AMM uh, Trust and MCRC as early as 1954. So it's been around for more than 68 years and all these trusts, schools, colleges, educational institutions are all managed by the ladies of the family. My chairman's mother, she's 84, and she has been running the Velayam Chetia School in North Madras. This school uh, takes in about 5,000 5, students, and exactly half of them are girl child and half of them are male child. More than 70% are first generation learners. This is in the fisherman area. More than 70% are first generation. You must imagine what a first generation learner is. They come from families where have been hugely protein deficient, even if they make all their effort and learn, they'll forget things as quickly as they learn. So it's an amazingly difficult kind of background from which you take students and educate them. She's been managing it for 40 years. Their success rate is more than 99%. So that's a far, far more difficult business to run. It's not a business. It's a, it's a social, uh, socially relevant cause. And they spend all their time running the, the non-business part of the Murugappa group. <laughs> And so that's important as well. Now coming back to conflicts. So the conflicts were managed very effectively. The last C as we talk is culture. Eventually what makes the Murugappa group big is not the 16 family members of the Murugappa family who are in business. It's how to get the 30,000 odd employees of the Murugappa group to feel that they're part of the Murugappa family. 
That's getting the family to become bigger, and that's where you build culture. Now, culture is built by very many things, and I'll give you an example of some of them and how they do this. We have what is called the five lights, the guiding principle on which the group is run. It's respect, responsibility, quality, integrity, and passion. These are the five lights, five guiding principles around which the whole business is run. Now, the family has to exemplify in every one of their action how they stand by these five lights. And that's how you build culture. Like you know, there are events. Events move to hub processes. Processes move to habits. Habits move to culture. It almost takes you 30, 40 years to build a culture. And the group has been so much at it to build a culture that we say this is the Murugappa way of doing things. And that's what builds the larger family of 30 or 1,000 people. So I'll give you a couple of examples. When Mr. M. V. Subaya, a chairman at that time, retired, and there are other rules, it's probably is good to mention. Even if it's a family member, he retires at 65. He may be however good it is, he retires. And at 65 he retires, he'll go back and do work for the socially relevant causes. Maybe he'll be in the in the in the foundation, he may be in the trust and other things, but he will retire from running commercial businesses. So Mr. Subaya retired at 65, and at that time. They did not have an immediate family member to talk, take over as a group executive chairman. So they brought in an outside person by the name Mr. P.S. Pai. Mr. Pai at that time was the president of Wipro, and he was brought in as a group chairman. And the stalwarts who had to report to him were Mr. Alagapan, Mr. Velayan, Mr. Murugapan. They were all family members. And once they decided to bring an outside chairman, they subject themselves to the same discipline of having to report to this chairman. And Mr. Subaya, the retiring chairman, wanted to show an example that he says when he hands over, he really hands over. So he said, I'm not going to be in Chennai because people informally, formally will start coming back and referring or checking with me. So at 65, he decided to go to Kellogg's and do a family business conclave. And he actually studied for two years there at Kellogg's on the family business management. And said, I'm not going to be here. And when we hand over to an external chairman, whoever, he would be the chairman. And that's it. And that's a discipline you subject yourself to. That shows respect. That shows responsibility. That's how you build culture. I'll give you a couple of other examples. One of our earlier chairmen, some of you may have known him, Mr. M. V. Arnachalam. Uh, outstanding gentleman. And I remember once we were in, uh, in one of our guest houses in Delhi. It was really one of those cold Delhi winter, not the warm Delhi of today. And we had a couple of, uh, we were having dinner and the evening, a couple of youngsters from TI came to the guest house. Uh, they were from Chennai. They were woefully inadequately dressed for a, a Delhi winter. And they came in shivering into the guest house. They had no booking. We were having dinner. And he said, come, sit down, have dinner. And then they quickly realized very sheepishly that there was no booking there. And the guest house didn't have rooms. In those days, we didn't have all these telephones and uh, emails. So you had to send faxes and probably didn't come through or whatever. And then very politely, he said, OK, Srini, now let's go. We go out and stay in a hotel so these guys can stay in the guest house. So let's go out from here. Now, what did he do by that? He sent a message that there is respect, there is a responsibility. You must look after your colleagues. There are many, many such things which demonstrate a commitment to quality, commitment to integrity. And integrity is not just in terms of being honest. It's much more than that. Integrity to what you think, what you direct, and what you do. One other example worth mentioning in this would be the famous saying of Mr. M. V. Arnachalam, one of our chairmen of many years. He used to say in the bicycle business in those days, and Ram was running bicycle business for many years. And bicycle business always is very difficult. In those days, we had license. You could produce only that many bicycles. If you, didn't, if you wanted to produce more, you had to go to Delhi to get a license. And we wouldn't go there because we, do, we have one of the uh, lights, file lights as integrity, and license are not given. So we had only that much, and we would produce that many bicycles. And when you produce less bicycles, you don't make money. So one of our suppliers in those days used to be Munjals, the hero group of today. And they used to make parts for our bicycles. And these bicycles would be made. And the famous saying of Sarnachalam always used to be, 
we will build bicycles for profit if we can, but for loss if we must. But we will always build outstanding bicycles. And we have stayed true to that because we couldn't get more license. We couldn't make money. Probably he had a prophecy that we will never make money in bicycles now. So he mentioned that if you have to make for losses, we will, but we continue to make only good bicycles. So the commitment to quality, the commitment to integrity was always demonstrated by action. And that's what ensured that the group built a culture. And that is what ensured that the group could stand up and say, look, when we say this, we do this. And so those were the five C's, as I say, which built a family business. Our business has been around for more than 100 years. As with everything, the fourth generation has moved. Now we have the fifth generation coming in. So in family business, we always say first is a set of entrepreneurs who start the business. Then it moves to the inheritors who inherit the business, who try and develop it and make it better. And then it moves to what I call as trustees. They have inherited a business which they have to control, guide, magnify, and convey to the next generation. So the third generation onwards, you become trustees. The Murugappa group has seen a generation of trustees who have run the business. They have the next generation coming in. The challenge is how to keep it going. Like I said, family businesses last, only 3% last for three, four generations. We're moving into the fifth generation. We have lasted so far. The culture helps organization to stay together. And when I talk of culture, and I'll say this last anecdote and I'll close, family businesses are relevant because they serve a mid path between, let's say, state-owned enterprises and the more corrosive, cash-only, quarterly result-oriented corporates. They sit in the middle Goldilocks spot where they are midway between the two extremes. They are not laid back, they are not hugely risk-taking, they are ambitious. They are not, um, let's say, regressive, they are not far aggressive, corrosively aggressive, they are ambitious. So they always sit in the middle, the Goldilocks mid-spot, where they are relevant to the communities, they are relevant to the societies they operate in. And when you talk of culture, this is not just India. I'll give you an example of one, and this, with it I'll close. We were looking to buy a company in Russia. And uh, Russia, even today, is a very, very interesting country. Things are run differently in those countries as well. So we were trying to buy this company from an oligarch. Oligarch are those big guys who run businesses, and they're always surrounded by people carrying AK-47. So we were negotiating with uh, our chairman and me. We were negotiating. We had sort of more or less done this transaction. And the last days, we were supposed to meet the, the two oligarchs. Some of them are in jail, so I can mention their name. So uh, these are the Aninia brothers. Um, and they were running, at that time, the Promise U.S. Capital Bank and the Promise U.S. Bank and all that stuff. Um, so we were trying to buy this company from them. And he was one of them in the Duma. Duma is the parliament. So uh, the last days, discussions are going on. We had more or less agreed, but we were haggling for uh, three million in the end. So since morning, the discussions are going and going. There's not even water on the table. Big room, empty, bad table. And teams would come and sit on that side, go away. And then another team will come and go away. We don't know whether we're going forward or backward, and we're discussing. And, some, and I was losing patience, and I tell Murugu, let's go. We have had enough of this. These guys don't want to sell. They can keep the company. So let's go. And my chairman is never flustered. He says, Srini, wait. I said, Murugu, it's just two hours for the flight. And Moscow traffic is horrendous. So I said, let's go. He said, no. Just get me a piece of paper. So he takes a full sheet of paper and a nice handwriting. He writes a short note to the Anania brothers and saying that, look, um, we have done everything. We have come here. What we offer is good for the company, good for its employees, good for you as a seller, good for us as a buyer. It's good for everybody. So I think we should go ahead and do it. I'm sure you would have been busy in the Duma. I was sure this guy was sitting in the next row. He said, I'm sure you'll be busy in the Duma, but as soon as you come back and take a look, give me a call and let's see if we can still do this transaction. So I go there, I give it to his secretary and said, look, we're going. And she said, just give me five minutes. I'll, I'll just call him up. And then for sure in 10 minutes, the two brothers come and I'm sure you, these guys are probably in the next room. And then we have a discussion. 
And the last bit of haggling was, look, we can do the deal, but you must take out this property, which is a nice piece of, uh, it's like a resort just by the side of the Volga River, where the employees get to go and spend two weeks there every year as some kind of a benefit for them. It's got a nice resort kind of a thing. And so he said, you must take this off from the transaction and you should give it to us separately. We don't want to sell this. You take it off from the company and you should give it back to us. And the rest of the deal is done. But if you still want this, you must give us three million. So I said, Murgu, this is not a part of our uh, uh, payback calculation, everything. What are we going to do this real estate? Just give it back and let's go ahead with the transaction. And Chairman says, no, I'll not do this. The employees of this company are used to having the two weeks of vacation. That's an entitlement that they're used to. I won't do this deal if you don't buy that. So I said, Murugu, but this is not going to pay me back. And my payback will go up, and I don't want this. He said, no, we will buy it with the property. I don't want a loser in this. So we paid that $3 million and bought it. And the story doesn't end here. I was always saying, why the hell do we spend more money and I have to earn this back damn thing? So the story didn't end there. So a couple of years back, we had the 55th year celebration at uh, uh, the Volsky town. It's, these are the old big town building enterprises. There are more than about 1,800 people working there. So it's a small town, so almost 1,800 family are there into a big town hall. All of them are there to celebrate with us, more than 4,000 people. And MM was uh, speaking there. He was speaking in English. And I believe 99% of the people sitting there didn't understand a word of what he was saying. But they were listening and clapping. They were clapping, clapping, clapping. He had done good for them, and they respected it. And they had seen value. He had demonstrated culture. He had demonstrated that what you do is not good for only the company, but it must be good for the community, for the employees, for everybody. And that's where family businesses can take those calls, which is beyond financials. And that makes a big impact. And that's all about building culture, building long-term value. So ladies and gentlemen, you have a long day ahead. Thank you all for being here. And thanks, uh, Group Captain, for having me here. Have great deliberations. Wish you all well. Good luck and God bless. Thank you all very much.